the Holy Gospel according to John. Glory Glory to the Lord. Therefore Pilate entered again into the praetorium and summoned Jesus and said to him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered, Are you saying this on your own initiative, or did others tell you about me? Pilate answered, I am not a Jew, am I? <clears throat> your own nation and the chief priests delivered you to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, then my servants would be fighting so that I would not be handed over. But as it is, my kingdom is not of this realm. Therefore Pilate said to him, So you are a king? <coughs> Jesus answered, You say correctly that I am a king. For this I have been born, and for this I have come into the world, to testify to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth hears my voice. Pilate said to him, What is truth? Pilate then took Jesus and had him scourged, and the soldiers twisted together a crown of thorns and put, his, put it on his head and put a purple robe on him. And they began to come up to him and say, Hail, King of the Jews, as they slapped him in the face. Pilate came out again and said to them, Behold, I am bringing him out to you. Jesus then came out, wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. Pilate said to them, Behold the man. So when the chief priests and the officers saw him, they cried out, saying, Crucify him, crucify him. Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and crucify him, for I find no guilt in him. The chief priests answered him, we have a law, and by that law he ought to die, because he made himself out to be the Son of God. Therefore, when Pilate heard this statement, he was even more afraid. And he entered again into the praetorium and said to Jesus, Where are you from? But Jesus gave no answer. So Pilate said to him, You do not speak to me? Do you not know that I have authority to release you? and I have the authority to crucify you? Jesus answered, you would have no authority over me unless it had been given to you from above. For this reason, he who delivered me to you has the greater sin. Hearing this, Pilate made efforts to release him, but the priest cried out saying, if you release this man, you are no friend of Caesar. Everyone who makes himself out to be king opposes Caesar. Therefore, when Pilate heard these words, he brought Jesus out and sat down, sat down on the judgment seat at a place called the pavement, but in Aramaic, Gabbatha. Now it was the day of preparation for the Passover. It was about the sixth hour when Pilate said to the Jewish leaders, Behold your king. So they cried out, Away with him, away with him, crucify him. Pilate said to them, Shall I crucify your king? The chief priest answered, We have no king but Caesar. <clears throat> the Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. <laughs> Father Jim Callan of Spiritus Christi uh, Community in Rochester, New York, uh, was telling me a story. Uh, in fact, I think he told it to all of us some years ago when he came here um, and preached at St. Matthew's. Um, he was telling a story of how he was taking uh, a group of teenagers who were part of the confirmation class at his parish through the church and explaining the various things uh, and the symbolic meanings because the, uh, the church is filled with all kinds of symbols and all that. And he asked the class, what is the most important symbol uh, that, that is here in the church? And one of the young people that was with him uh, uh, in an effort to, to mess with him uh, said, oh, the exit sign. <laughs> and Father Jim Callen uh, uh, 
was very quick with his wits, and he says, You're absolutely right. The exit sign is the most important symbol in the church because we come here to leave. We come here to be filled with the grace of God, to hear the good news, to be nourished with the sacrament of his body and blood and filled with the presence of Christ. Then we are dismissed to go and take this grace that we have received out into the world. So you're absolutely right. The edge of time is the most important thing. Uh, but um, actually, there are three essential furnishings within the church uh, in, in a sacred space. And I will mention that to you. Believe it or not, the pews or the chairs you're sitting on are not considered essential. They are considered a concession to the people of God because the preacher might be a little bit long-winded, you know. So it's a bit of mercy that you even have pews or seats to sit on in, in our church. And our seats, I have to say, are pretty comfortable, mm -hmm. wouldn't you say? Yes. And, and, and you can take a nap right now, even, if you like. <laughs> there are three essential furnishings within the church, and I'll briefly tell you what they are. Uh, one should be obvious to you. This is the altar. And the altar or the table is absolutely essential because it's upon this table which has been consecrated as our altar and set apart that we celebrate the great sacrifice of the Mass, the Eucharistic meal. And we gather around this table. So the altar is a very important, essential furnishing in any church or sacred space. We take it for granted, but I'm drawing your attention to this at, at this moment. Maybe now uh, uh, it will uh, uh, deepen your appreciation of, of, of the space that you're in. The altar is a symbol, and it symbolizes Christ. And it symbolizes a particular aspect of his messianic office or his messianic mission as the Christ. This altar represents Jesus Christ as our high priest. Because he offers the finest and best sacrifice of all. He sacrifices his own life, offering it up to God and to us. So this is what this represents. The altar represents Jesus. And so when we bow here, we're not bowing to the, to the, to the artwork. We're not bowing to the priest behind the altar. We're bowing to the altar, which symbolizes the presence of Christ among us as our high priest. And then there is another essential furnishing in, 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 in any sacred space in the church. You probably recognize this. In Protestant churches, it's called a pulpit. Um, in Catholic churches, it's called an ambo. That's Latin. It means the same thing as a pulpit, I would imagine. But this, too, is a sacred furnishing that is a symbol for us. It is a symbol of Jesus Christ. The pulpit itself, or the ambo itself, is a symbol of Christ. But it's a symbol of Christ in a particular aspect of his mission among us. It represents Christ as prophet. Because Jesus comes to speak forth the word of God. And it's from this that the readings of scripture, the prophets are read, and it's from this that the gospel is proclaimed, which is the words of Jesus himself. So the ambo itself is a symbol of Christ. And yet there is another uh, furnishing that is essential in every sacred space within a church. And it's back here. I don't know if you can see it. Can you see this chair? No, no. <laughs> Now can you see this chair? This is called a cathedral. It, it is a chair. And it represents the throne of Christ. His seat of authority. For Christ is the highest authority within the community of the faithful. And it's a symbol too of Jesus. This cathedral or this chair represents Christ in a particular aspect of his ministry. And that is his ministry to us as king. So we have the threefold messianic office of Christ, in which are combined the three traditional offices of the holy nation of Israel, that of priest, prophet, and king. Jesus is the high priest and the only priest from which all other priests derive their authority. 
They only represent the priesthood of Christ. There is only one priest and only one priesthood. And we all participate in that by virtue of our baptism. We are a nation of priests. But we are only priests in that we derive it from Jesus. He is the ultimate high priest who offers his very life for the sins of all the world. And then there is the office of prophet. He is the one who is the divine word. He not only speaks the word, but Jesus in his very person is the word of God made flesh for us. Jesus is not only the medium of the message, Jesus is the embodiment of the message. The medium is the message, as McLuhan said many years ago. And if you remember McLuhan, you're far too old. <laughs> then we have Christ as our king. He is the king of kings. He is the Lord of lords. He is the only rightful king that should rule within the hearts of human beings. And the question before us today, on this last Sunday of the liturgical year, on this day which is called Christ the King Sunday, is this. Who rules within your heart? For you see, there is a cathedral or a throne in every human heart. And whoever you place upon that throne becomes the highest norm, the highest standard, the highest criteria by which you assess your values and to make your decisions. If Christ is on the throne of your heart, if he is ruling in your life, then that's going to determine the decisions you will make in your day-to-day -day discourse with your friends or at work and whatever you're doing, among members of your family, however you're doing. That will make the determination. If wealth, money, riches, are what you honor as the highest supreme authority in your life. If that's what rules you, it will reflect in the decisions that you make with your life, how you spend your time, and what you do with your wealth. I could go on and on, but I think you catch the point that whoever you acknowledge as the most important value in your life, whatever you acknowledge to be that which rules in your heart, that will determine the course of your entire life. But it is only Christ who has a legitimate claim on your heart. All others are false Christs. All others are false gods. Jesus lays claim on your life and on your soul. When he went to the cross and carried that cross, when he died upon that cross, he was laying claim to the human race and in particular, upon your human heart. This is why we celebrate Christ as our King. In today's Gospel, we see a startling story. Jesus is standing before Pontius Pilate. The Roman governor, the man who represents the emperor in the affairs and in the governance of Judea. In the city of Jerusalem he was because of the great Passover and a great gathering of people were there. Normally Pontius Pilate would live in a city called Caesarea which is on the shore of Israel. It was a Roman colony and that's where he had his residence. But on Passover, special festival days, uh, the governor would come to Jerusalem and take residence in the Roman fortress there that overlooked the temple on the Temple Mount called the Fortress Antonia, named for Anthony. Tony. <laughs> and so there's where he would be, and that is where the trial of Jesus before Pontius Pilate takes place, as he appears before him in today's gospel. Now one of the greatest temptations for human beings is the temptation to want to possess power over others. Human beings so very easily become tyrannical in the power that they have. If you have a little power, you become a little tyrant. If you have a lot of power over a lot of people, you become a nightmare of a tyrant. And sometimes it leads to the death, perhaps, of millions of people. The quest for power is one of the things that obsesses the human heart. So if you are a control freak in your family, that would probably be evidence that you have a desire for some sort of power in your life. 
even if it's restricted to your family alone, even if it's just over your children or over your spouse or those who are close to us, or if you're a megalomaniac, perhaps you want to have exercise power over an entire nation. And so from the dawn of human history, we have been creating what we call civilization, which is a way of managing power. Great empires have come and gone. And we think of the great names of the great uh, powerful, the great and powerful of the past. Nebuchadnezzar of, of Babylon, Sargon of Assyria, or Belshazzar, who we've heard in today's reading from Daniel the prophet, who was a great king over Babylon, a great empire that day. Or we think of the pharaohs of Egypt. Or we don't even have to go that far into our ancient history. We can think of those who wield great power in our own day, or more recently in the 20th century. We think of Joseph Stalin, or Adolf Hitler, or Mussolini. Those are easy ones to think about. But even today, we still have those who are basic tyrants and are grasping for power over others. The thing about all governmental systems is that they are subject to human corruption and that all of the civilizations and societies and governments that we have created throughout history have been a cause of great suffering to others. Even the United States of America and our government, which is an attempt to create a more just society, to use things like democracy and the dignity and equality of every human being, even that was built upon the sweat and the blood of slaves. It's a part of our history. We had to fight an entire war to rid ourselves of that terrible and diabolical institution among us. But all governments, to some extent, will oppress some more than others. And oftentimes, they oppress the majority. They oppress those who have no power. And so people become victims of human government and of tyrants and leaders, but they never last. You overreach for power due to hubris or, uh, or, or to a, a, a higher estimate of yourself, and usually the most wicked of tyrants and kings, the most powerful of, the, of them, end up having a dramatic fall. But then no sooner do they fall than another tyrant rises up to take his place. This is the sordid history of the human race. There is something terribly wrong with the human heart because it works itself out in human society. And we see again and again oppressive governments that bring oppression and suffering to so many others in the world. That which is designed for the common good becomes the greatest enemy of the common good. And that is the woeful story of the human attempt at exercising kingly authority. One of the greatest empires of all time was the empire of Rome. It was the greatest superpower of its time. And in the story in the gospel, we see Pontius Pilate there standing or sitting on his judgment seat. Jesus is standing before him. What a contrast this story is. What an image this is. You have the badly beaten, bruised body of Jesus, his clothing torn, his face bloodied and covered with the saliva of his, uh, of his tormentors who spat on him, with a crown not of gold, but a crown of thorns, there he is standing before a representative of the most powerful worldly government that existed in that day. And there you have Pontius Pilate, the embodiment of the imperial power of Rome. And they have a conversation. And the dialogue between Jesus and Pontius Pilate is not only dramatic, but significant and revealing. Pilate approaches him and asks a few questions of Jesus. And his tone is rather mocking. So you're a king. Ah. And Jesus responds, you are quite right. I am a king. But my kingdom is not of this world. In the course of this dialogue between Pontius Pilate and Jesus, we see something about the human heart that is revealed to all of us. We also see something about God that is revealed to us in the person of Jesus. This is why this story is so important. 
Pontius Pilate has all the confidence of one who is in a position of great authority. He is surrounded by his military, the best troops, the best military in the ancient world. He is surrounded by bodyguards who are heavily armed. He's there and the crowd is around in the courtyard in a place called the pavement or the praetorium. And the, con the con interview continues and Pilate is frustrated with Jesus. He says to Jesus, so you are a king. It is true, Jesus says, I am a king. And it's for this purpose that I was born, to give witness to the truth. And those who hear the truth always hear my voice. And then Pilate says to him with disdain, what is truth? How pathetic a picture is that? Here is Pontius Pilate asking the question, what is truth? As if truth is completely relative and subject to one's own personal interpretation. Here is Pilate who has this kind of uh, uh, way of, this way of looking um, at, at, at truth and he's not even realizing that truth itself <coughs> embodied in the person of Jesus is standing before him. You want to know the truth? Look at him. The one who said, I am the truth. Pilate missed it altogether. But Pilate begins to lose his nerve. He begins to lose control. We are told by the writer, he becomes afraid. <clears throat> and then he turns to Jesus, asking him more questions, to which Jesus does not reply. He only responds in silence. And then out of sheer frustration, Pontius Pilate looks him in the eye and he says, don't you realize that I have the power to set you free, to allow you to live, and I have the power to crucify you. I am the one who has power over you. And Jesus responds to him, the one who was the embodiment of imperial power. You have no power. You have no authority yet that which has been given to you from above. Your power is an illusion. What little power you really have is only delegated power. And again, Pilate makes a desperate effort to free Jesus because Pilate realizes the truth of what Jesus is saying. Pilate is merely a pawn in human events, in human history. He has no power. And so we see in this story of the trial of Jesus a contrast between the rule of God and the rule of humanity. Do not put your trust in human beings. Do not put your hope and your trust in human governments. They will always disappoint you. They will always let you down. They will always tempt you to believe the great lie and to live in a state of illusion. There is only one power which is legitimate. There is only one authority. That is the kingdom of God, and it is a kingdom of life. It is a kingdom of love. It is a kingdom of peace. It is a kingdom of justice and a kingdom of mercy and compassion. That is the rule of God. Very different from the rule of the Roman Empire, which was brutal and was looking out to favor the few against the many. A government that was exceedingly corrupt and known to have destroyed many lives through warfare, oppression, and economic inequality. This is the history of the world. And so now the church presents to the world its witness <clears throat> that there is only one legitimate king. He is the king of kings. And his throne is not an earthly throne. It is a cross of wood, an implement of terror, official state terror, and implement a symbol of worldly power. That's what the cross is. But with Christ's body hanging upon the cross, the cross itself is transformed from a symbol of oppression and tyranny and death and becomes a symbol of hope, of life, and of peace. That's the power of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords to transform even death itself into a means to life. 
And as he hung and suffered upon that cross, he took his place on the throne and he had a crown of thorns rather than a crown of gold. But at that moment, the cross becomes something very powerful to us. And it's why we are children of this cross. And the cross means this. The cross is the throne of the king of kings. The cross is the altar of the great high priest Jesus who offered himself as a ransom for the sins of humanity. It is also his pulpit. It is also his ambo because the symbol of the cross speaks volumes. It is prophetic. It speaks volumes and the cross reveals to us the terrible truth about the human heart and about the human condition. On the day of the crucifixion, it said more about human, the human race than it did even about God. But also in the cross, which is transformed, we have a prophetic message that God rules within the hearts of human beings. Who's ruling in your heart today? That should be our questions as followers of Jesus. Every day we get up, who is going to rule my heart today? Will it be the forces of fear? Will it be the forces of greed? Will it be for the desire to be important and get ahead? To take care of my self-interest? Or will I surrender my authority and pledge my allegiance to that one who is rightly called the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords? That is the question that is before us today. And our lives will give evidence to who is our rightful ruler, who's ruling in our hearts. If we are displaying the fruit of the Spirit, if we are living lives of kindness, peace, love, and compassion, and mercy, and justice, then we have demonstrated and have objective evidence that our King, the one who rules in our hearts, is Christ. But if we are looking out for number one and pursuing our own self-interest, have become irritable and angry, who have put our trust in human beings rather than in God, then we have revealed who rules within our hearts as well. May Christ reign upon your heart, for he shall reign forever and ever, and of his kingdom of love there is no end. That, my brothers and sisters, is the gospel of the Lord. Let us stand and profess our faith.